Welcome to Church on the Rise. It is our hope that you are encouraged, enriched and enlarged as you listen to this week's message. Um, I really like this morning too, what I really look for in the service and we've done a lot of things in church. We've been in big churches, we've passed our own church, we've met in places like universities and things like that. We also spend a little bit of time in, in, in house churches too. So, and what we really liked about Ollockton House Churches is it wasn't so much focus on me preparing and doing everything. Um, it was about, as people come together, sharing a little bit too. And what I really liked about the services, how, and, or sorry, in the, in the home church experience, is that how things dovetail together. Sometimes we're there going, I don't really know what to share. But then somebody would come along and it's like, I'll just leave it go. Well, maybe something, God's going to do something else with somebody else. And surely that would happen. Someone would come along and they'd bring a word or a teaching or one of the kids would bring um, a, a prayer or a testimony. God's got the whole church thing under control. And I just like this morning how, um, when we're singing, one of the songs, guys, was with the worship team about firm foundations. Um, yeah, it was one of the words in there, and it was, thank you. And it was, so it was one of the things that I, I feel quite passionately about this morning, and one of the things that I think is really important, that as people of God, we need to continually be reminded of the firm foundations, because um, it never gets boring. Because day after day, you and I are assaulted with the lies of the enemy. They're non-relenting. They're subtle. And sometimes, as you'll hear from my, my testimony, they're full on. So I really want to share this morning about, I guess, my testimony. But firm foundations are really important because wherever there's a theological void, Satan will surely fill it with his lies. So it mightn't be that the, the church is doing something, speaking wrong about something, that there's an error. It's just the fact that there's silence about a certain important foundation. The devil gets in there and he sows seeds of doubt and confusion and causes all sorts of havoc. It's so important that we be reminded of these things. And I just hope today that through just talking about one essential foundation, it's just going to lock the devil out. And if he has gotten a little bit of a foothold in there, we're going to kick him out this morning. We're going to do a good job of it because God's word is true and we sung about it, God is faithful. Hey, Vince. <laughs> There's Vince. Good to see a familiar face. Um, so this morning, I would, what I would ask you to do is just open up your heart to God. It might be through the speaking of the word. It might have been through worship. It might be through ministry afterwards. God loves you dearly and God wants you to be set free from the things that you don't have to lug around some things we need to endure and we go through but there are some things that the devil lumps on as baggage we got to cast it off yeah. and i pray this morning that that's exactly what he does so um michael asked me to i guess share the message today quite a while ago hey and um silly man and um i actually got an invite um and i guess during that time um i had a fair bit of time to think about what i would be sharing today and as I got a bit closer and closer to the date, it became more and more apparent to me that I felt God saying it's time to share a part of my testimony. To be quite honest, a little bit reluctant about it, and you'll understand why as we get into it. But I really got a strong sense of it. And what really did it for me in terms of, no, you need to share it, is I was, um, I catch up with a friend recently, he's a believer, been through a pretty rough time of late actually, he just lost his wife. And without going into the whole situation, um, what a man of God, but what... What a life he's lived. He's got it. There's a book in him. It's just incredible what he's gone through. But I was uh, having a coffee with him. We're eyeballing each other and we're just talking about things. And I forget what the context was, but, but he actually said these words. He says, Martin, he says, I feel cursed. Now, this is a, a, a true man of God. If you were passing the street, if you'd seen him working, if you'd seen him, um, you would not ever even think that those words would come out of this man's mouth. Yet here he was in a vulnerable moment and he's, he's come out and he said, I feel cursed. And I thought, well, my friend, I'm here for, <laughs> for you having this coffee for a particular reason and let me assure you, you are not cursed, you are blessed. But we have an enemy who hates our guts big time. And um, when I heard that, I thought, it's time to share my testimony because as we'll find out in a minute, it's, it's a part of my testimony um, about, yeah, not putting up with the rubbish from Satan. I remember um, there was a period in my life 
um, of about four years when I was going witnessing down the Gold Coast. I do some street witnessing, love it. What I found is people actually like talking about God. They like talking about spirituality. What they don't like talking about is church. They don't like um, thinking that any talk about spirituality is a hook to bring them into your church to shake money out of them or to heap condemnation on them. Um, but they are quite freely talk about the things of God and quite happy to talk about what their view of, of God and heaven and hell. But as I was driving down there, I, I loved it. But what I found myself doing is well, I had a real passion to... Um, I mean, I don't want to see people go to hell. None of us want to see people go to hell. <clears throat> so what I'd find is that I'd spend my time talking about the Scriptures um, and using the law, and the Bible's very clear in this, that the law is very useful in bringing people to Christ. In fact, that's the only use of the law. It has no use in the Christian life whatsoever. But in terms of using it um, to talk about um, a person's need for Christ, the law is essential. Um, and so I would use the law with great effect. You'd see the conviction of the Holy Spirit come along people. But I just found myself, you know, what's getting to the grace of God and talking about what Jesus had done. I just wanted a bit more zing in it. <laughs> I don't know, that's the only way I could describe it. I wanted the, the, the grace message to flow in a, in, a, in a greater way. And I remember driving down and saying, God, I want to understand your gospel in a greater way. Friends, don't ever pray that prayer. <laughs> because God certainly did answer that prayer. And for the last seven years, God has been doing just that for me. And I've been um, you know, born again since I was 25 is when God got gave an eye. Um, and it's like this, you understand something, but then God gives you, it's time for a deeper revelation of that. Yeah, I get salvation. Yes, I, guess it's, I get that. But then there's a deeper understanding. And I was really hungering for that deeper revelation of the gospel. And had I known what I'd go through, I probably wouldn't have prayed that prayer because my journey to understand the gospel in a greater way was through mental illness and it was through depression and anxiety um, and it was to a pretty severe level which we'll get to in a minute so it was well, I'm talking clinical depression and clinical anxiety and through that I have come to understand the gospel in a great way um, so as I'm sharing my testimony hang into the end because it does get better <laughs> it might be a little bit dark in places but um, have I got those that's here, I might leave them till later. God got Gabe and I at the age of 25. And even from the beginning, I personally had a very strong sense of God's call in my life, and I had a specific purpose. Gabe and I were given leadership roles in the church pretty early on. I mean, we were identified as people, you know, um, who had the capacity to lead, and Gabe and I with joy did that. We loved Jesus. And it was a pretty radical conversion, I'd say, wouldn't it really? Like, we, when we got the message, we ran with it. There was no mucking around. Um, I was a bit of a binge drinker, so when I got this message, nobody told me you shouldn't be binge drinking, but inherently, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes to the inside, Martin, not quite so good for you. So I'd go home, chuckle the grog out, and away we go. It was a pretty radical conversion. Um, we were pretty involved in ministry and with youth, and we were assistant pastors and doing some volunteer work for quite a while. Um, soon after, I enrolled in um, full-time ministry, and that was um, with the su wonderful support of my family. Um, and, and that's what I did for, what was it, three years, I think. Three years it was. Um, I'm the sort of person who likes to do things and do things good. I'm a bit OCD. I'm a bit of a perfectionist and whatnot. In hindsight, I look back at myself and I think, well, man, you, Martin, you should have seen the signs back then, brother. <laughs> but, but I didn't. I, I, I didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, Gabe and I, as, as Michael had said, we pioneered a church down the Gold Coast. Um, it was a pretty stressful time, I've got to say, because we, we didn't really have um, strong support around about us. And to a large extent, we're, we're kind of on our own a little bit uh, through different circumstances. So that was a pretty stressful time. A few years later, while pastoring, I was also then in full-time work. So I was trying to do all this and have full-time work and do it at the same time. Can anybody get a bit of a sense now that things aren't headed in the right direction. <laughs> you've you got a full-time job, you're trying to pass through a church, you're someone who's a bit of a perfectionist, um, starting to see where this thing's going. Um, I had a full-time job, um, which, was, which was pretty stressful, but then a cyclone hit. And I don't mean a cyclone, Larry, I mean a personal cyclone. Within a space of one month, Gabe and I were dealing with a pretty relationally stressful situation. Um, 
we lost $70,000 in uh, business investment. We had to sell the house. We had, to move our, uh, we had to move into a new house. One of our kids was going through an extremely distressing time at school, and if you're a parent, you know how your heart breaks when that happens, and you're hearing stories of bullying and, and rejection. Um, what else was happening in that time? Oh, yeah, I developed severe, arth- um, arthritis, severe psoriasis, it's a skin condition which is brought on by stress. It got so bad that probably 75% gave. I, I'd say that my body was covered in... Um, uh, it's, it's a rash, it's a dry rash. Not contagious or anything like that, but it's, it can be quite painful. Um, oh, yeah, and I lost my job. So this is all in the space of a month. And so one of those things, or two of those things, the body might be able to handle sort of thing and handle quite well, but um, obviously it took a toll. I didn't know it back then. I just mowed it on. I just dug in there. I knew God was with, with me. I knew that you know, this was an attack. I knew all those things. You know, we might know those things, but we still live in this body. And this body has limitations. We don't get to be the glorified body until we go to be with him our spirit is renewed our spirit is born again but we still carry about with us this thing and it has limitations and without knowing it back then i look back now and that was probably a defining point where i was i was in a fair bit of trouble two very stressful jobs after those issues it was about this time when I was witnessing on the Gold Coast, Gold Coast that I prayed the prayer that I mentioned earlier. You know, God, I want to understand your gospel in a deeper way. Not long after I prayed that prayer, I had my first breakdown. It was probably a couple of, couple of years later. Away on holidays, in fact, in Caloundra, um, not far from here, Gabe and I and the family, which this used to be our regular spot for how long? 14 years. Michael kicked us out. Michael moves in. No, you can't come. <laughs> Isn't he horrible? <laughs> it was about, yeah, it was about, yeah, well, for about 14 years we are coming up here. And <laughs> so we're living on the Gold Coast and we're holidaying in Caloundra. See, that's how good Caloundra is. <laughs> uh, you guys know it. But we're here in, Col- here in Caloundra um, and I, w- I was reading a book that I was wanting to, to learn, you know, just being encouraged again and how to hear the voice of God clearer again. And a part of that book um, spoke about, well, you know, if you want to hear the voice of God better, then you've got to be making sure that all your relationships are in order. You can't go coming to God expecting to hear from Him if you're not, you know, if your relationships are, are out of whack, if there's things that need to be resolved. So, of course, what does Martin do? He starts more navel-gazing. Um, the worst thing that you could possibly do um, for someone who's already <laughs> hypersensitive about you know, how he's performing for God. Um, you know, as a person who is a bit of a perfectionist, as someone who um, takes his calling from God quite seriously, as someone who um, is, a, to be honest, a people pleaser, I, liked, I, liked the, I didn't like people not liking me. In fact, I could never understand that. I mean, <laughs> Michael? You hear what I'm saying, don't you? Some people, I I don't know. There's no pleasing some people, Michael, is there? Um, But and then to then inward look and start to look, it's just it's just wrong. It's it's just so so wrong, and it's not what we're encouraged to do in the Bible, actually. Um, But I I would take great to be honest. I saw it as a virtue. Well, you know, yeah, God, you know, if there's anything within me, the sin of David, you know, seek me out and find me if there's anything in me. Um, Wanting to do it for the right reasons, but as we'll see disaster so um so as i was doing that um i then went to bed in a pretty agitated state not sure not sure what i should do um because of a um, stressful relationship what's my part in that god what do i need to do do i need to say sorry do i need to all that sort of stuff going so i went with that little going on in my head at i remember the time exactly it was 12 12 uh, at that night i sat bolt upright in bed to hear one word it was just one word. It wasn't audible, um, but it was, it was a very clear word. It might as well have been audible. And the word was cursed. Just one word. And then what happened after that is very, very hard to put into words. But the way, only way I could describe it was like, um, God had turned his back on me. That's what it was like. It was like God had said, I've, 
Martin, I'm done. And what then followed was a blackness that I can... <laughs> it is, it's almost, unless you've gone through it, it's impossible to describe. But um, it was just like, it was total condemnation, total isolation, total rejection, final, judged, done. As you can imagine, I was distraught. You know, it's like Job said, the thing that I feared the most has come upon me. I, you know, I wanted to be pleasing to God, yet here I was, done. Now look, for everybody here who has... Well, Martin, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But Martin, you know, um, I shall never leave you nor forsake you, he says. What you've got to understand is my brain was so, so tired and worn out from fighting, it was done, it was broken. So at that stage, in, with what was going on there, it's not that I wouldn't, I could not fight back. I was done. And so the devil, if you like, just had free reign to heap every amount of condemnation that he possibly could, and he did it. He is a mongrel. He chose his moment very... He, he knows this, he's got demons reporting on us all the time. It's no problem for some, a demon to speak to a um, soothsayer and to say, you know, and people get explained, oh, wow, they knew my past. Well, of course they do. There's demons reporting on us all the time. Um, but they can't tell our future, right? <laughs> they, don't, they don't know that. God knows that. Um, they know me quite well. So at that stage, yeah, I totally burned it. I immediately went to the Word to try and get comfort, to fight this thing with the Word of God. We've got the sword of the Spirit, right? I went into that Bible and it did not bring comfort. The Bible that had brought me much comfort before that I'd gone to to be assured and comforted was now my greatest enemy because all it did, every scripture I read said, guilty. See? Guilty. Guilty. The Bible is a spiritual document that cannot be interpreted through carnal wisdom in fact when people try to do that they get cults they are killing people in the name of jesus we've seen it it's a spiritual document that must be read and understood spiritually and at that stage there my mind was a mess so i've gone to it and all i'm getting is condemnation condemnation and judgment um What happened then was, I guess, over the space, I, I didn't get any sleep for days. Um, it was just total black. So he, he, here's a picture of Martin continually crying to the place where there's no more tears. It's just dry. I had no more, no more tears to give. Um, no sleep. I was in a fetal position, rocking backwards and forwards. I'd lost it. Um, Gabe, of course, who has got her own wonderful testimony... Um, of how God got her through this has just been amazing and I wish I had time to talk about what Gabe did and Gabe will at some stage bring um, help and, and encouragement and comfort to the great support people around people who suffer mental illness because uh, you need to know your stuff and God will assault you and God will condemn you and try to bring you into this thing too so Gabe's got her own story of how she wonderfully cared for me um, but uh, I could literally fear fear in my gut. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this before, but it was like something I could touch. It was in my gut. Fear so strong of the rejection of God and the judgment of God, it was like a ball in my gut that I could touch. It was, it was almost physical. And I don't know. I, I don't know how else to describe it. There was, there was nights of no sleep and continual torment of mind. You know, I've been rejected by God. There was no hope for me. I was going to hell. I'd cry myself dry and shake uncontrollably. Um, my mind just was broke. It had been so damaged by stress that it had stopped producing what we later came to learn through um, research is serotonin. You know, we're, our bodies are chemical beings, right? And that serotonin in, in your brain is not released. It is impossible to feel things like joy. It's impossible to feel things like hope. And when the brain's not producing that, you're not getting any of those things. There's no possibility of you to feel joy. There's no possibility of you to feel hope. Um, I was exhausted I would wake up tired all the blinds are closed um, I, I, was, I was a mess nights turned into weeks weeks into months months into years and during this time Gabe had done such an incredible job of just holding it together and researching depression and anxiety particularly as it applies to Christians and I'm going to talk about this in a minute <laughs> the cruel thing about depression is that not only do you have all this going on, but then you've also got the added guilt of, well, you don't have enough faith. 
they've been not pleasing to God. There's this whole God thing of not pleasing him that gets lumped on it as well too. So Gabe did a lot of research about the, the, the um, impacts of mental health on, on, on Christians. I thank God for Gabe's love. I thank God for, love, uh, for Gabe's patience. I thank God for Gabe's faith because um, she totally lost all of my support. I was worse than a child. I was like having 13 children. I would want to have theological debates with Gabe about why I'm going to hell and we'd be, I'd be coming, to, wouldn't I? I'd be waking up saying, as, as a new scripture was coming to my mind, but what about this scripture? What about this scripture? How long did that go on for? Like months, months. So I don't know, I don't know how she's got a sanity. Um, um, but Gabe, through her research, ha- had found out that um, um, she convinced me that, Martin, it's a medical condition. Now, I wanted to fight this spiritually, right? I wanted to fight this purely from a spiritual level. Gabe said, Martin, come on. I've done the research. This is a medical condition. You can't think straight anymore. And for me, I fought that because I thought this was my fault and I needed to dig my way out of it. So this led to trying to a number of different forms and strengths of medication. Finally, after months of trial and error, and for anyone who's been through this experience, you know what a crappy experience that is. You go through all the highs and lows of trying something that's going to fix up your mind, and it is a horrible experience. You're all over the place. You're not thinking straight. Your emotions are out of whack. We finally got onto something that started to work, Um, and I could start, just start to reason things through properly again. About a year after being on medication and making sure but steady progress, I made the decision to come off medication. Now, I guess I felt I was strong enough now and I didn't need it and there had been good progress that had been made. I suppose deep down I felt, must have felt, you know, I'm a Christian and I shouldn't be having this stuff. After six or 12 months later, I can't remember exactly how long, but this decision proved to be costly because I suffered my second breakdown and this one was worse than the first. This one actually landed me in the mental ward of the Gold Coast Hospital for two to three nights. Actually, it was longer, you were saying. I was in there for a week or so. Once out, I was on double the original medication and the task of healing had to start all over again. And that was like probably about two years to get me to a point where I thought, yeah, I'm okay, I can kind of tackle it a bit now. <clears throat> I then also got regular counselling at this stage, which was another significant step in my healing. We found a great teacher of the Word of God in the Gold Coast whose ministry was to teach the body about their eternal security. We talked before about firm foundations. There's one that is, I think, needs to be spoken about a little bit more in the church than what it does, because we just assume maybe that, well, we know that. And that is this doctrine of eternal security, and I want to talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. Because what I want to talk about is what I've learned out of mental health, anxiety and depression, and I also want to talk about the doctrine of eternal security. Both really, really important issues for the church, I believe. I think we've uh, underestimated how much damage the devil has caused by ignorance in these two areas. Um, Counselling was good. We found a great teacher of the Word of God whose ministry it was to talk about, you know, um, our eternal security in him. There's another great guy. So that that person was Ken Legg. He's got a ministry down the Gold Coast. Still a personal friend. And um, Andrew Farley's another guy. Andrew Farley Ministries. Um, Push him if, you, if you type in Andrew Farley Ministries, F-A-R-L-E-Y, you'll find him. Um, solid, solid, solid. God is raising up people to heal the church and to fill this theological void um, and raising up ministries to solely talk about this one theological foundation. That's how important I believe it is for the moment and for the church to um, be healed and restored in this um, vital uh, piece of theology. Um, So once again, slowly but surely, the light started to appear again and the austere God that once um, my weakened mind produced was replaced by a loving Father who cared deeply for me. Wrong concepts about God, wrong and faulty biblical interpretations were replaced with grace and truth again. And I was able to rest in the finished work of Jesus. And I can truly say that you know, some people say that, oh, you know, I, I, well, I need to rely upon God. I, I need God. 
I know that experience, I know that intellectually, but I know it experientially. I need God. When I wake up in the morning, I need God for His strength, to even just to not want to have a nap two, two hours later. God, can you help me get me through my work day? Someone who had a very, very strong sense of will to be brought to that place, to be honest, it sounds uh, like, mm, that's not sounds like a good place to be. It's wonderful. Because I now trust Him for everything. I mean, everything. My provision, my health, my mental health, my ability just to, to, to latch a hold of His grace. I need Him for everything. I mentioned I want to talk about two things. Um, first is depression and anxiety as it results to Christians. Um, and, and the second is the doctrine of, um, um, you know, that of, eternal, um, and of our eternal security in Him. Depression and anxiety, let me talk about that for a minute. In Australia, it's estimated that 45% of people will experience a mental health condition in their lifetime. 45%. That's massive. We're talking about a big problem here. In any one year, around 1 million Australian adults have depression. And over 2 million have anxiety. So at any moment, at any given time, no matter what year, you've got 3 million Australians who are suffering under the cruel burden of anxiety and depression. Um, I should say here too that obviously when we're talking about anxiety and depression, we're talking about a pretty wide scope, right? There's, there's Nutbag Martin over here and there's also, you know, mild. It's, you know, like um, anxiety comes but they kind of get it under control. There's clinical depression and there's, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's this big range that's there. When they're talking about these sorts of stats, these are significant issues where people have had breakdowns, where they're struggling going to work where they're struggling holding it together, where they're struggling getting out of bed. Um, Three million? It's interesting that um, employers know how much of a big deal this is because it's costing them heaps in productivity and whatnot. It is a major issue in Australia. Here's some things that I have learned about depression and anxiety. I've learned that the church is not immune from mental illness. If you think that your faith um, will somehow absolve you, from some of the challenges and some of the issues and some of the pain that is associated with having a mortal body in this life, you're up for some disappointment. We have a body that is prone to sickness and sin and breakdown. You might be surprised to learn that many of the great leaders of Christianity suffered from depression. Anybody heard of a man called Charles Spurgeon? reasonably significant man in the movement of God. Here's something you may or may not know about him. Charles Spurgeon's view of depression was that he had suffered with depths of depression even deeper than those described by John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan himself was a man who, who suffered tremendously from depression. We get snippets of it in the Word of God. We see Elijah who said, God, i take me away, I'm over this. You read the Psalms, have you read the Psalms? Have you read about David? I reckon there's a few times he was like saying, get me out of here, this is too much. We're a mortal body and we know that sometimes it's just too much. And we see in the Bible these, these great men and women of God, you know these great men and, men and women of God were? People who were broken, who knew their limits and who trusted trusted in the fullness and faithfulness of God. As Christians, we're told to be anxious for nothing and conclude that God's only answer to mental illness, to depression and anxiety is just stop it. Isn't it right? Just stop it and everything will be okay. So, we believe that our trust in God should eliminate things like doubt and fear, keeping quiet about the anxiety and depression, we do our best to ignore it feeling like a failure because our mental health is less than perfect. So as we talk about some of those statistics, let's, let's bring it home, let's bring it right here. Here this morning in this church, right here, there is a significant number of people suffering under this cruel condition. And it breaks God's heart. He doesn't want to be silent about this issue. 
how is it that we have altars full of people who want to be healed of cancer and we're happy to pray for those breakdowns in our body it's somehow we're, and we're happy to talk about that because there's an acceptance somehow there's un, unwritten unspoken acceptance well that's an acceptable thing to come up for but mental illness ooh. maybe it's because you haven't got enough faith certainly that was I guess one of my fears and wanting to present and coming forward that people would judge me as someone who's not quite a real Christian but I was encouraged by people Charles Spurgeon I was encouraged by people who had fought this fight and these are people we esteem greatly and they'd gone through the same thing and my hope this morning is this I mean I, I don't know how I got I don't know how I got through that apart from having the most exceptional lady standing beside me and family but that just God just somehow I, he just I, I don't know I don't know how he did it I don't know how people don't go insane I don't understand how people can think that if a person commits suicide that they're going to hell even as a Christian what the flip is going on there seriously do you think God's going to punish someone whose pain is so extreme and great that the only solution that they think they've got because their mind is so bent is that they, they need to take their life friends come on have compassion on these people and families have compassion and, and, and understand God is not angry with these people he cries he breaks his heart is broken for that you know there was a part in Jesus like people who go through this sort of stuff Jesus in the garden if you remember he said my God my God why have you forsaken me they've had a touch of what Jesus went through I don't know how had I've, I've had to bear if you like a bit of a, a bit of a taste of this, my sin and condemnation can you imagine what it's like to have the sin of the world <laughs> placed on you in that garden and for that moment God actually did literally turn his back on Jesus friend if you're going through any of these sorts of things and anxiety and depression you have an advocate who has walked in your shoes Jesus has experienced all things all things he's not here to condemn you he's here to set you free he loves you deeply he's he, he's touched that he, he's had an experience of that uh, he, he knows i've learned mental illness is not just a spiritual issue depression anxiety is a whole person disorder with biological sociological social and spiritual roots addressing only one or two of them does not solve the problem in fact trying to treat clinical depression and anxiety from a purely spiritual position is almost always destructive in my walk anything spiritual i mean if i was going to see um what was some of the movies going on that time um what was that trilogy that was filmed in <laughs> lord of the rings lord, obviously that's got some who said that lord of the rings thank you that's who it was was it someone here anyway it was say it was um it was i'll go to see that and the spiritual content because there's obviously as you can understand there's a spiritual backlay to that whole whole movie um i couldn't be there it was so distressing and so disturbing i could not listen to worship worship music I could not read the Bible because it was con condemning me. The last thing a person needs who's suffer a Christian who's suffering from, f from f fatigue, mental illness, don't quote the Bible at them. Just listen. Just be there and tell them it'll be okay. Um, all the spiritual stuff does, it just, it's, it's more confusing. There's, there's obviously wrong thinking that's going on and it needs to be broken. Without that medical intervention, it ain't going to happen. Um, clinical depression and anxiety attacks need multiple strategies to bring healing so you've got the biological and chemical thing I only started to turn around when we found the right medication and that might take several trials before you find the right one maybe there's people here are going through that or are thinking about going through that because things have, have reached a you know, critical point in their lives um, know that it mightn't happen the first time you mightn't get the answer the first time that's okay because, uh, look, I haven't got the time to, to talk about what the research we've found, but there's different types of medication that target different effects. For example, if your issue is more anxiety-related, there's a particular drug that will use to attack the anxiety. If it's more depression, um, even, even if you've got depression, there's different sorts of drugs that'll, that'll sort out different things. So it's, it's, it's a real trial and error process. It's not pleasant. But what I want to say is that it will be healed you will find the right one you've just got to go through the crap you've got to go through the trying this and trying that um, but here I am 
you know, in the mental, war, mental hospital um, in the Gold Coast, in the deepest, darkest part, and here I am sharing hope of Jesus because the truth has come again. So you might be sitting here going, well, God can't use me. I've got all these issues going on. Look, friend, the one with all the issues going on is probably the one who's got the most compassion. And what has happened in your life, what does the Bible say? All things turn around for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You don't have to have all your stuff together to be effective for God. In fact, you're probably a hindrance. A little bit of pride might creep in there maybe. You know? You might be in the, in the valley right now, but I want to promise you, you might be in the valley right now, but there will come a day where you will stand on the hilltop with God again and declare the glory of God. It will happen. All things work together for good to those who love God. Michael said it this morning, he's greater than everything. Now, I wish it just happened like that, but it didn't. The one thing we've got to give God that pleases him right now is our faith. That's it. And you might think, well, I don't have faith because I'm doubting this, I'm doubting this. The fact that you're standing, asking the question, seeking out for spiritual guidance, you have faith. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> you have faith. Um, I've learned that... Oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's biological. Psychological is also important. It may take, take two or three or four or five different visits to different counsellors before you find the right one that connects, that has the skills, the spiritual understanding, the strategies to give you so that you can start to retrain your mind. So you get your mind right, it's able again. Look, when you're taking medication, here's a thing, oh, so it'll change the way that you are. It'll make you happy and be someone that you're not really. No, it doesn't do that at all. It doesn't make you happy. It doesn't make you do anything. All it does is create space again so that your brain can start to think logically again. So then if you choose to meditate on the truth of God's word again, then it can do its work. So it doesn't make you any different. It doesn't change your personality. It doesn't change anything. All it does is give you the space again to start to think again, to give your mind rest. Because what happens, you get these cyclical patterns of thinking that just you can't break out of. And so it enables the trigger to break and so you can do that again. Um, so once that's happened, then you can go to a counsellor and you can start to accept another person's point of view and say, hey, hang on a minute, maybe I have been thinking wrong about that. Finding the right person is critical. Now, if you don't find the right person the first time, that's okay. So thank you very much, sir, but I'm not later, go and try somebody else. All right? Someone who gets it gay, how long would it, how many visits would it have been before for us to find the right one? Maybe three? Three different ones? Some of them were shocking, man. <laughs> Terrible. You know, they just didn't have a clue. Um, the one we found was exceptional. Really, really good. And so he gave me strategies to be able to to break out of the wrong thinking. Um, so that's important. So it's not, just, it's not just spiritual. Biological first, psychological second, and I believe it is in this order, and then you can start to introduce the spiritual. At the right time, after addressing the biological and psychological, you f- should find a true grace teacher who will untangle the wrong interpretations of Scripture that you have taught and believed. You must find the right teacher. And unfortunately, in the church... You get mm, guys and gals who are um, different parts of their journey. Um, they've probably got the best intentions, but they're ill-informed about some doctrines and they're ill-informed sometimes about mental health issues. Um, we need to be very careful because we can actually heap more condemnation on them if, we're not, if we don't know about something, send that person along in care. Make sure they find the care that they need by somebody who knows their stuff. All right? We're not Jesus. We haven't got the whole package. So we need to refer them on to people who can help um, here's one thing I've learned about mental health and depression and anxiety you don't get mental illness because you're weak you're weak because of mental illness isn't that a common concept that I think we sometimes have is that oh that person's basket case because they don't have the strength of will no they're that way because their strength of will was so strong that they reached their limit fighting in their mind that it broke and then because it broke, now they can't reason. We don't get a broken leg because it's weak. We get a broken leg because it's, it's hit a concrete pillar or it's done something like that and it's, and it's broken. And we've got a weak leg now because it's broken. And it's no different to our mind. Our mind is an organism like a leg, like anything else, that can be broken. So it's not because you're weak, not because I was weak. 
um, that we get mental illness, we get mental illness and we become weak. I've learned that as a sufferer, when you can't sense God one-on-one with Him, look for Him and His people. And again, we're talking about my case, it was clinical depression, but hey, you just might be going through the blues right now and it's like, I don't feel God. Where is He? Am I in His plan? Is He forgotten about me? Is He displeased with me? It might be the, be the stage where you're, you know, you're, you're totally, your mind is broken, but I know even before, this is continual fights that I used to have. God, are you happy with me? Uh, am I doing the right thing? Am I, you know, are you, am I pleasing to you? So, I've learned that when we can't sense the presence of God, trust His body, so that when someone comes along you yeah, and gives you a hug and says it'll be all right, and you haven't been hearing God in prayer time because you're in the valley, that's God giving you a hug. That's His arms. And for me, I thought I was looking for my one-on-one relationship with God and God's going to get me out of this by, you know, giving me this word. I don't, I don't know what I, my expectations was. It was more like one-on-one. God had to convince me, Martin, I'm all around you. When, when that person comes along and says, Martin, I love you, which I needed to hear, that's God saying, I love you. If you're not sensing God and you're, where are you, God? That's okay. Just look around here today. Spend a bit of time with your brothers and sisters. And you'll hear God and you'll see God. He's here, but he's in, our, he's in the body. God really delights in that, actually. How good is it as parents, you know, when you see... Uh, like we're just seeing such an amazing dynamics in our family as brother and sister are now growing up and, and love each other, supporting each other, challenging each other. They're doing that. They're, they're, they, they grow and develop. They're being God-like. They're speaking. They're using his words. They're giving that hug. They're giving that phone call. It's awesome. I've learned that rather being um, evidence of weak faith, depression has been a common route to spiritual growth. Those who have journeyed with Jesus into and out of depression know, experientially and not just theoretically, that they can only survive when God is ever present with them in every moment, that He's the first and only focus of their faith. God truly answered my prayer to know the gospel in a deeper way. It is deeply impressed in my heart. I understand it deeply and I find joy in it at all times. Wake up and, oh God, I thank you for the bed. God, I'm not having to perform for God. I just have to rest in what Jesus has done. I've learned that carers of depression, uh, carers of people with depression uh, and anxiety, I would say this, you need to share your burden with a select trusted group of friends. You must get yourself um, encouragement and support around about you. You need to research and gain knowledge. And the most important thing is with the person you're caring for, be patient with them. They're not thinking reasonably. Keep telling them that. It's okay. We'll get through. We're going to find the right medication. Keep bringing that hope out there. That's all you can do. And sometimes it seems, Gabe, well, you're hitting your head against a brick wall, hey? Huh? I don't, I don't know how she did it. I don't know how she did it. Gabe's got her own story on how she did it. I think it's remarkable. Um, I'm sharing here today because I want you to know, fellow sufferer, that you are not alone. You're not the only Christian who is suffering what you're suffering. You're not alone and it will not last forever. You will get through. What really ties into this whole area too and what caused me a lot of discomfort is what I found was a, um, a theological void in, I guess, some of my, my, my growth and some of my um, development. I remember sitting in a church, when we were looking for a church at one stage, once we finished pastoring and we were, um, 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 we were looking for a good church. I mentioned Ken Legg before, one of these great, great teachers of, of Grace, Grace Message. We were sitting in his church Ken had said a few words and I remember look, looking at Gabe going, oh no, he's one of those once saved, always saved preachers. <laughs> he's one of them. Didn't go back to his church again until after I had a breakdown. Maybe there's something in that. Um, once saved, always saved is such an important doctrine. Michael and I were talking about it uh, later on. Um, does that mean that once saved, always saved, and you turn your life, you, you deny Jesus and that he is who he is and says who he is? No, of course it doesn't. There's only one unforgivable sin. Do you know that? 
What is it? Sorry? The direction of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's not suicide. It's, not, it's, it's, it's when you don't accept Jesus for who he is. That's it. Everything else is under the blood. It's done. Everything. I mean, this is what mental illness also does. See, I would never have preached or never have thought or taught that you, know, that, um, that you could lose your salvation. But somehow my sin was different. Somehow what I did and what, what I thought and what I'd done is different. And that's what mental illness does. Um, somehow you're different. God can forgive their sins, but not, but not your sins. Um, it, it's just wrong. Um, you, you don't go to hell if you commit suicide. You don't go to, to hell if you commit adultery. You, you don't go to hell if you're watching porn at the moment. You don't go to hell because you've stolen. Do you know that God actually likes using the troublemakers? Do you know that in the lineage of Jesus there's a prostitute? Do you know that there's an adulterer in David and, and, and a, um, a liar in Abram? These people are in there to show that it ain't about your works. It's not about what you do. It's not about what you say. That has nothing. When, when you come to Jesus, those things mean naught in terms of your acceptance to God. Nothing you can say or do impresses God. It's not just the knowledge. When you go to the knowledge of the, um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's not just the bad fruit that's bad. It's not just the bad fruit that brings death. It's the good fruit that brings death. Your good works mean nothing in terms of salvation. Are they important? Yes, they are. In terms of rewards, and you know, God does want to give us rewards, if it's done for his kingdom and not through selfish ambition and try to earn brandy points and it's just by the flow of his spirit, they have, of course good works are important, but they have nothing to do with your salvation. Absolutely nothing. Church needs to understand that there is justification and there is sanctification. Sanctification sucks. <laughs> because we've got to kind of work with him a little bit on that, right? We've got a part to play in that and that's by yielding. It's by allowing God to flow through us. And sometimes our flesh doesn't want to do that. Do you know that our flesh has not been redeemed? Do you know that inside your flesh, your body, dwells no good thing? Is it a surprise then that your flesh sometimes breaks out and has a bit of a win for the day? Does that mean you're somehow less of a Christian? No, your spirit is redeemed. God doesn't even see you. He sees his son's righteousness. Every requirement of the law was fulfilled in Jesus. Your stuff, good or bad, nothing to do with salvation. Everything to do with Jesus. You know, I was thinking, God, I think you could have come up with a better, um, better um, description of what's going on. It's not good news. It's bloody great news. <laughs> like, seriously. <laughs> the other thing that it blows my mind is that, you know, we look back in Adam and Eve and, oh, wouldn't it be good to be back then? Oh, wouldn't it be good? Do you know we've actually got it better than Adam and Eve? You know what Adam and Eve had? They had innocence. Guess what can happen to innocence? It can be lost. Guess what can happen to righteousness when it's imputed? <laughs> Nothing. When God imputes, when God declares a thing, done. And what, you, what he says is that all of you who believe in my son... I declare you're righteous. I don't care what Satan says. I don't care if Satan says you're cursed. I don't care. This one, I was seeing my friend having coffee. Seeing my friend having coffee, says I feel cursed. Hey, guess what? It's a lie. Don't worry. I've been down to the depths of that. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. There's just nothing. I want to show you something awesome. Um, I'm going old school here. Get your tablet, or whatever. But I just want to quickly let you have a look at. If you can go to Genesis chapter 15. If you haven't got your Bible, I'm going to read it out for you. Um, so it's all cool. But it might just help if you, if you have got your Bible to have a quick look. Or your phone or your whatever you've got. Genesis chapter 15, chapter 5. Is this all okay? Is it, is it helping? Like, I hope it does. I, I really believe that later on, there's, you know, God wants to set us free from this junk, these li the lies of the devil. Um, Genesis chapter 5, oh sorry, Genesis 15, Genesis 15, 5, we're going to start there. 
Where am I going to? I'm going to 17. <coughs> okay. So, chapter 5. He took, he being God, took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens, count the stars. We know this story well, right? If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed God. And what does your Bible say? Some might say it was imputed or it was, it was credited to him as righteousness. Is that what it says? What did he do? He just said, Oh, you're going to do that, God, are you? Oh, cool. He believed it. And what did God do? Declared him righteous. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land, to take possession of it. But Abram said, oh, he's having a whinge now, I sovereign God, how can I know that I shall gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Michael had you believe that they should have bought cats. Is that right? <laughs> I just want to say something here that have all you had to endure this... this I, I have heard that there's been hate speeches from this pulpit. Is that true? Yes. Anybody, got, anybody got, cat, got cats here? Come, no, 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 not, not, not. Has anybody got cats here? <laughs> How long have you put up with this nonsense? beautiful creatures only secure people can have a cat insecure people have dogs anyway Abram brought all these to him cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other the birds however he did not cut in half the birds of prey came down on the carcasses but Abram drove them away and as the sun was setting Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him then the Lord said, said to him, Know for certain that your descendants shall be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and will treated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that they serve as slaves. Afterwards, they will come out of the great, with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. Then the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure." Excuse me. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking blazer with a blazing torch, hey, we'd love to have seen this, appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt, the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Uliites. He said, this is, this is all yours. Now, what I want to draw your attention to this passage is, is one peculiar thing. Um, in ancient Hittite uh, ceremony, we, we, we see that this covenant ceremony is almost exactly the same as what you'd seen in, a, in, an, in the Near East at that stage. Almost identical except for one point, um, where the inferior par party would walk between the bleeding pieces of split animals, taking on the oath to his superior. So it'd be the weaker one going through the, um, the, the sacrifice. Uh, in return, they would experience the blessing of receiving the protection of the superior party. But the covenant ceremony we just read about departs from this norm in one critical and one totally mind-blowing way. Here the Lord made himself lower than Abram for the establishment of the covenant. He made the commitment. He walked through the sacrifice. He made the promise. So as God is doing all of this, now let's turn our eyes um, to what Abram's doing in this ceremony. God's doing all this. He's doing what he's... So what's Abraham doing? Can you remember in your Bibles what he's doing? <laughs> he's asleep. <laughs> Why do you reckon God did that? I reckon I've got a pretty good idea now because if Abraham was awake, maybe he might have stuffed it up. Maybe he might have said something. Oh, thanks God. If you do that, I'll do this. No, God couldn't have any of that because he had to foolproof this thing. See, if Abraham got involved, it wouldn't have been foolproof because there's a fool involved. If he involves you and I in this covenant... It's at risk of jeopardy because Martin's involved. There's a fool involved. So what God did is he made sure there's not going to be any human involvement here. I'm going to make the covenant. I'm going to be the one who declares the promise. I'm going to lower myself to the one who um, is, is the subservient one. And I'm going to do it so that the covenant will be irrevocable. It cannot be stuffed up because I, the Lord, the one, has made this promise and I will see it through. It had no conditions upon us at all. All he had to do was say, you know what? I believe you're going to do it. You're going to do it. 
He made the promise. He made the oath. Um, the righteousness that Abram got was imputed, just as it's imputed to us. Salvation cannot be taken away because we had nothing to do in its giving and we have nothing to do with its maintenance. God promised to maintain the covenant. If you think Jesus only died for your past sins or the present sins, you're going to wait a long time for him to come back again to, to, to um, pay the price for your future sins because he's not coming back again to do that. When he said it's finished, it's finished. Did you, you've been preaching about the finality of the cross of, of late, I think. We've got to get this. Unless we understand the finality of the cross, we will not move on to resurrection power because there's going to be works of the flesh in there and that's going to stuff it up. But when we understand the finished work of Jesus, we understand it is by His work and His work alone that when He sees us, we are the righteousness of God in Him. We can get on with the real meaty stuff. We can get on with the stuff of raising up the dead. We can get on the stuff of seeing people being born again without the condemnation, fighting off and taking all of our energy. Funny story is when I was in the, um, the health ward, the mental health ward, I was sharing the gospel <laughs> with people in there. I was struggling with myself and even knowing that I had, was right with God yet, here I was sharing the gospel, gospel with people. You know, it's got nothing to do with us. It's got everything to do with him. He is the one. He has secured it for us. That's why it's good news, right? It ain't good news otherwise. If we've got to maintain this thing, that's, that's not good news. That's the news we hear all the time. In fact, Paul says he got cranky with those Galatians, didn't he? He says, man, what, you start off in the, in the spirit, you're going to try and finish in the flesh? What the, what the Galatians going on? Salvation can't be taken away because he has nothing to do with its maintenance. We have nothing to do with maintenance. God is the one who took on the responsibility. All we've got to do is believe and he declares us righteous forever. Um, and just quickly, I just want to say this, that when, God has, when, God, when we fall short, we think, oh, maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm this. Maybe I'm that. Because, you know, Christians shouldn't be acting and thinking like this. But remember, in your flesh dwells no good thing. Romans chapter 7, we hear about this tremendous struggle. Paul says, man, what I want to do is not what I do. What I do is not what I want to do. It's like, what's going on here? You know what Paul said in that? Thanks, Jan. You know what he said in that? He said that, hey, it's no longer I who sin. It's sin dwelling in me. It's not me who's doing it. It's sin dwelling in me. That sounded for me like for years the biggest cop out that I've ever heard. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> Catching your kid out and... I don't know, what do they do? What's something they do, Michael? Oh, they're all perfect, that's right. My kids, and it is true, my kids used to, I don't know, what's something that they would have done or not done? I don't know, they've done something wrong. You, know, you pull them up about it and you go, hey, was that you? And they go, no, it wasn't me, it was sin dwelling in me. <laughs> How do you reckon that'd go down? <laughs> that's what Paul's saying. Can you get a sense that he gets the gospel? We will never be judged for our sin we will never be brought into judgment ever ever we will have to appear before him and there will be this great wonderful time of well yep that bit works yeah it gets some brownie points because it was done in my spirit that bit there it's going to go through the fire in fact we, t we hear about that and Paul talks about it that people who do these wrong things and, and uh, believers who do succumb to the flesh he goes you know, make sure you know what foundation you're building upon because it's going to be tested by fire. This is talking about works now. And if it's, built, if it's built with precious stones and things like that, it'll get through. But if you build upon this foundation with hay, straw, wood, going past the fire, what will happen to that? Burned up. Yet he himself will go through as saved, yet with the smell of fire. Can you see the difference between justification and sanctification? Yeah? You're, you're, you're in, baby. We're in. Rejoice in that. Rest in that. If you're suffering today from those sorts of anguish of am I right with God or just, just not having that hope, God wants to set you free today. I've talked about an extreme. You know, my, 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 my story is quite extreme. But don't underestimate, and I don't underestimate, nor does God underestimate, the absolute agony of having your past sins brought up, stopping you from enjoying the joy of the Lord now, stopping you from doing everything that He's called you to do. He has a place in, a, in His body that He just wants to 
get you out there doing stuff for his kingdom. And while you're fighting this fight of, you know, am I worthy, am I worthy, am I worthy? You haven't got the time to go out there and do the fun stuff. Time to do the fun stuff. It's time to do the good stuff. It's time to get out there and actually show that you're, I'm at peace with God. And how about, would you like to be at peace with God? Let me tell you a story. It's not good news. It's great news. We've got such a good story to tell, you know? And I just get a sense that, you know, there are people here today and as I've been praying, and if you have, look, it mightn't be, it mightn't be that you're, you know, you need to be, I think you need to be on medication, but you're just struggling with things that are just dark. The fight's been hard and it gets a bit messy sometimes. If anything has resonated with you today in that regard, I believe God just wants to bring some healing to that now. And I think today can be an absolute turning point if you let him. All those that the Father give me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive them away. John 6, 37. I will never reject them. I will never cast them out. I won't turn them away. Romans eleven twenty nine. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you, he will complete it. Verily, truly, I say to you, whoever hears these words and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but it's crossed over from death to life. Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering he has perfected, how often? Forever, those who are being sanctified. And finally, and this is what God wants to say to you today, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Has it been a bit weary? Have you been struggling? Has it been like, man, you've just been smashing pillar to post of late? Time to rest. Time to trust in Him. You've been fighting. You've done everything you can. That's good. We need to do our part in some stuff, right? But having done that, it's never enough. Trust in God. Trust in the Lord. Who's ready to trust in the Lord? Who's ready to say, oh, I've, I've fought my fight? Over to you, God. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. I hope that, Lord, what has been spoken, it will bring hope because it is a sure hope. Everything that I've spoken has not been out of a textbook. It's not been something I think is a good idea. You have revealed it to me. It has been revealed through me. I know that what I speak is the truth. And I pray, Lord, that that truth would continue to set me free and your people free in this place. What a joy it will be to come here unburdened by sin, unburdened by the past, unburdened by fears, and just rest. You promise us that rest. Why don't you do that now? Just in your heart, just reach out to God and say, that's it, Lord, take away the fear. That's it, Lord. I just give you now the struggle. I can't do it anymore. I give it to you. Lord, bring healing now. Touch the ones, touch the weary souls. Touch the heavy hearts and bring hope. Come against every lie of the devil. And Lord, fill that void, that theological void with your truth. When the sun sets free, it's free indeed. You know, you can get taken, just receive your healing now, right now in your seats. Um, but if you feel that you would like some prayer, please, please come up. If you feel that you need to respond in that way, I'd love to stand with you. you know, the guys would love to stand with you just to, just to hug you so you feel God's love just to speak some words of courage because they're God's words. Just invite you to come. Thanks, brother. If there's anything that you, you know, anything that you think, you know, I just want to release it and I just want there to be, I I want to look back and go, that was a day that, (laughs) all yours, God. I just choose to believe. We, we, We believe these things, but we need to be reminded of it, right? We just need to be reminded. Why don't you just come? So as we do that, and, and um, we'll just we'll just pray now. But look, you, you can do that in your seat. You can do it at coffee later on. You, however you want to do it, however you feel comfortable doing it, God's the one doing it. Just sit and receive. We'll stand and receive. Is there anyone else who'd like to come? Please come.
if you can pray too, or the ones if you want to pray too. Gabe, yeah. Awesome. And guys, if you're here standing too, maybe you've maybe you've been through this, or just I'll just ask that um, still be a part of this if if you can, and just um, just believe for breakthroughs right here, hey? Because if one person's breakthrough, there's a family that's breaking through, and there's a community that's broken through. Friend, there should be no shame in coming out because we're all broken. We're all broken. We're all, we're, all, we're all works in progress. There is nothing at all to be ashamed about. It'd be just as silly to be ashamed about coming up to be prayed for a broken leg than it is for mental illness. Come on. And we're not talking about these people coming up for different reasons. It might not be mental illness, but what I'm saying is if that is it, don't be ashamed of that. We need each other. Amen. Amen. As we lifted up your name, lifted up your name. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's message. If we can help you in any way, please get in touch with us via the web at caloundra.churchontherise.org.au.